Hi, I'm Jay from Real Street Performance. Today we're gonna to talk about how to read a dynograph. So the easy part would be a peak horsepower number, a peak torque number, but there's a lot of information that you can dissect from going to a chassis dyno, and we're gonna talk about how it can help you advance your program. So if you've not been on a chassis dyno before, there's a lot of information that you can gather about the vehicle in a very short period of time because the car is in the stationary environment and you can run it at wide open throttle and look over all the systems of the vehicle. So how is your ignition system? Is your fuel system keeping up? Does the turbocharger move enough air to support the horsepower number you're after or is it stacking up back pressure and is the boost falling? You know, do you have enough camshaft to reach the target RPM that you want to be able to have the most average power needed to accomplish your goals at the track. And these are all things that you can gather in one or two dyno sessions, which makes it really convenient because you're not going to haul the car to the racetrack to run it, to run into a problem. So a lot of the preparation stuff can be done on the chassis dyno in a safe environment. So while there are a handful of different brands of chassis dynos in the market, there's two main types of dynos. The first would be an inertia dyno, and the second would be a load bearing eddy brake dyno. An inertia dyno is a pretty simple device that offers consistent results provided you have traction. So the dyno roller or dyno drum is a fixed weight. The vehicle will accelerate that drum over a period of time. The dyno software will do its math and spit out a horsepower and torque number based off of how long it took to accelerate the drum. The downside to an inertia dyno is with high horsepower two wheel drive vehicles, you'll get into traction issues that you really can't overcome. So there, there is a limitation to a inertia dyno in that regard. The load bearing eddy brake dynos are a complete different beast. They use basically what would be a, a high speed train brake. You flow electricity into that brake and try to slow the vehicle down or hold the vehicle back. So you could have an eddy brake dyno that looks like a regular chassis dyno where the, the wheels and tires are turning drums, or you can have a eddy brake dyno that there's hub fixtures that actually bolt directly to the drive axles of the vehicle, eliminating any traction problems. Now, as you get into high horsepower vehicles, you know, two, three, 4,000 horsepower vehicles, that hub dyno becomes a really, really neat tool because you can make quarter mile passes right there stationary with the vehicle. And when you get into high level race cars, that's a pretty invaluable tool because you can become ultra prepared going into events because you have access to this machine that you can run the car whenever you want. The downside to an eddy brake dyno is most of them have fairly adjustable software. So there's a video that AMS did years ago on how to adjust the horsepower output of the dyno. They made pretty good fun of the video um, and it's worth a watch. It's worth the education because those dynos are easily manipulated. The other downside to a eddy brake dyno is the engine horsepower is being fed into this brake or this absorber. So the signature of the engine gets muffled. So on a inertia dyno, if you have ignition problems or misfires or anything else like that going on, you'll see it in the dyno graph. Whereas with the absorber, a lot of stuff just gets muffled. So you don't really see the raw signature of the engine on a hub dyno or eddy brake dyno the way you would on an inertia dyno. For the sake of learning, we've compiled some dyno sheets from our inertia dyno jet. We're gonna go through them and kind of discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly. First, let's understand how the dyno graph is laid out. The horizontal axis is gonna be engine speed or vehicle speed, and you can think about this as time. So on the left-hand side of the dyno graph is gonna be the beginning of the run, and the right side of the dyno graph is when the vehicle reaches either the maximum engine speed or the maximum vehicle speed for the gear that you're dynoing in. The vertical axis is horsepower or torque. The higher the line on the graph goes, the more horsepower or torque that's being indicated. Sometimes you'll see a split vertical axis with the horsepower scaling on one side and the torque scaling on the other. This can make things a little bit confusing when you're comparing two graphs, so just take note of it. So another thing to be aware of when you're looking at a dyno jet dyno sheet is there's a correction factor that can be applied. So up here in the top right, it says CFSAE. And if you go into the different correction factors, there's six of them. Three of them are very common. So uncorrected would be the weather that the engine is currently being dyno in. So if you dyno in August in Florida and it's hot and muggy and there's just wet, nasty air, the engine's gonna make less power than if you dynoed say in South Jersey in February where the air is just amazing. That, that could change 40, 50, 60 horsepower, depending on the combination. 
The second one that's commonly used is STD. Now, STD is something that they came up with in the early 70s. It was one of the first correction factors when dinos were first kind of coming into their own. And later in the 80s, they switched to SAE, which was the Society of Automotive Engineering deemed the standard correction factor that they would all go off of is SAE. So if you dyno your car in Denver, in Florida, in Louisiana, anywhere around the world, and you're using that SAE correction factor, you should have the same numbers no matter where you are using a dyno jet. And that kind of makes it handy. But again, if you're comparing your dyno numbers to another person's dyno numbers, look at the correction factor. The typical procedure to dyno a vehicle is to bring the vehicle up to speed in whichever gear ratio is closest to one to one. From there, the operator will have the engine around 2000 RPM, mat the gas pedal, start the run, and run the engine to whatever the max safe engine speed or tire speed is, then the operator will stop the run and the dyno then turns on its brakes and the data is compiled. So let's take a look at a pretty basic dyno run. The line on the dynograph is how much power the engine was making at each RPM or mile per hour that it traveled through on its way through the gear. If you pick any point on the horizontal axis and go up from there, you'll see how much power it was making at that point during the dyno pull. If you imagine this area under the curve shaded as a different color, the bigger the shaded area on the dynograph, the more overall power the engine makes. If we divide the dynograph into three columns, we can consider the left column to be low end power, the middle column to be mid range power, and the right column to be top end power. Here's a dynograph from a big responsive engine that comes into power hard as soon as it goes wide open throttle, and it carries that power all the way to the end of the gear. This is a 440 inch supercharged LS engine. This next graph is a small engine with a big turbocharger. So you have a B series and a 67 millimeter. So it experiences a lot of turbo lag down low, but ultimately achieves roughly the same power by the end of the gear. So the reason why we've picked these two very different engines is because we wanna illustrate that while they both read roughly the same amount of power, how they make that power is completely different. So if you just go off of the dyno number itself, you miss out on a lot of valuable information. When we overlay the dyno sheet from each one of these very different engine combinations, you can see that they would have a very different feel if you were to go wide open throttle at a very low RPM. The larger engine has a ton of torque under the curve and would probably just spin the tires immediately, whereas the smaller engine would be laggy and powerless until it came up into boost. We could compare the mid-range and top end power the same way. Now that you know your way around a dyno sheet, let's introduce another consideration. Let's call it the operating window. So if you have an engine that you shift at 8,000 RPM and on the gear change it falls to 6,000 RPM, the engine has to then accelerate back to the next shift point. So that's your operating window between 6,000 RPM and 8,000 RPM. And you wanna do modifications that are gonna keep that in consideration. If you gain peak power but lose power at the gear recovery, there's an opportunity for the car to be making more power on the dyno as a peak, but just as fast as the racetrack because it averages the same. Here's a dyno sheet of my Toyota Supra with a 7675 versus a 7685. 7685 made more peak power, but at the drag strip, it trapped the same exact speed because when I made my gear changes, there was less power available and the car took longer to recover from the gear changes. Now let's go through some examples of problems that you may run into when you go to the dyno. The first one is wheel spin. So as I mentioned earlier in the video, inertia dynos, you, you're trying to maintain traction during the run. And as this turbocharger increased boost, the tires came loose on the dyno and then eventually it catches back up and it meets basically back its old run, but this is just a traction problem. The next example would be knock retard. So at this point during the run, the ECU saw what it deemed to be cylinder knock or detonation and it pulled the ignition timing down out, it added fuel, and that's where you have this decrease of power that eventually starts to come back up as the engine regains control of itself. Here's an example of a loose torque converter. So when I floored the car and it went up in a boost, the engine horsepower is like the same all the way across the graph. And that's because the engine just goes to one engine speed and the tires are playing catch up. So eventually the torque converter gets a hold of the slip and the tires speed up, but it's kind of a funny looking graph. So if you're doing an automatic car with a loose converter, you may end up with something that looks like this. Another problem that's fun to find on a dyno is ignition issues. Whether it be the system doesn't have enough voltage, the coils aren't strong enough, the spark plug is, gap is too big. These are just problems you run into with boost. So as boost increased, it, we started to get these big 
chops in the dynograph where it's just misfiring in cylinders. And you can either decrease the plug gap or increase the voltage or increase the coil capacity to make for a stronger ignition system to work with a higher boost level. But this also brings us into our next concern, which is sampling or smoothing. So most dynos have a filtering rate or a filter ability, and you can look at a sheet with zero filtering or with the filtering on. And what that's doing is it's taking a capture or an average of the samples of the drum and kind of applying them to the graph as a filter. So you can see zero filter and a filter of five. I prefer that we always show runs with zero filtering because it's a better illustration of how the engine's actually running. The last thing that we'll talk about, and it's kind of a thing with dyno jets, if you run into the rev limiter, if you're incurring wheel spin and the wheel spin stops, look at these blips. So when you look at this sheet right here, those are illustrated in that peak power number, but they're not real and you can change them with filtering. So it's always a good idea to look at the graph as a whole. And if you have any irregular things on the graph that don't look right, chances are they didn't happen or you have a problem. The dyno graph should look smooth and consistent with how the engine sounds and runs. It's just another piece of information that you're kind of putting in this case as you modify the vehicle and you make it run stronger. I hope you've enjoyed this video and that the information is valuable to you as you go through the process of building your car, you get into the process of getting the car tuned. Thanks and I'll catch you next time.